Okay, I'm hitting the button. We're gonna go live. Yay! I'm glad it worked. Well, I hit the button. It yep. works. Webinar it says live. Streaming live on Facebook. Excellent. Yay. Uh, welcome, everyone. <laughs> um, this is the very first session of the Food Sovereignty Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Caitlin Reed. I'm an assistant professor in the NIS department at Humboldt State um, and I'm the assistant director of the HSU Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workspace. Uh, this is the very first speaker series hosted by the HSU Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workspace and with your enthusiasm and support, uh, the first of many. Uh, this speaker series will continue every Monday throughout November from 1 to 2.30 p.m addressing a range of perspectives on indigenous food sovereignty. Uh, before we begin, we will acknowledge Humboldt State University's occupation of unceded Wiat territory. Uh, this territory includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. HSU is located in Arcata, known as Goudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Wiat peoples continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture and stewardship. They are important parts of not only the history of this area, uh, but also in continuing knowledge of this place. Um, as numerous indigenous scholars have articulated, land acknowledgements um, are a beginning, not an end. For land acknowledgements to be meaningful, they need to be accompanied with action. Um, so today my call to action for all of you is to donate to the Humboldt State Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workspace. Um, I'm pasting a link into your chat uh, right now. Um, if you would like to donate and support the HSU Food Sovereignty Lab and the work that we are doing, um, you can donate at this link. The title of our panel session today is HSU Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workspace, History and Vision. We are joined by the director of the lab, as well as two key members of the steering committee. Cody Henriksen is of Dena Ina and Sugpiak descent and an enrolled member of the Nanilchik village tribe of the Kenai Peninsula in the great land of Alaska. Cody is a senior undergraduate at Humboldt State University, double majoring in marine biology and Native American studies. His passions for the ocean, food sovereignty, and his tribe have led him to his professional goal of creating and managing marine aquaculture systems in his home state of Alaska. Cody hopes that in doing so, he may provide economic growth and stability, a source of food sovereignty and research opportunities for his people and community. Uh, Carrie Tully is a graduate student in the Environment and Community Program. Motivated by her own complex life experiences, she strives to address, understand, and seek ways to heal traumas by building relationships with people and the more than human world. This passion is what drove her to work on her thesis, Reindigenizing Landscapes in Arcata, a framework for me, uh, rematriation of Gukdin, as well as the Food Sovereignty Lab. There is a fundamental need for local communities to build and maintain stronger bridges between them. It is Carrie's aim to establish some of those bridges uh, via this work. And in April, 2020, both Carrie and Cody were awarded second place for graduate level social science research at the CSU student research competition for their work on the food sovereignty lab and cultural workspace at HSU. And uh, I hopefully we'll get to hear about a little bit about that today. Uh, finally, we are joined by Dr. Kacha Risling Baldi. Dr. Risling Baldi is the department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University and the director of the HSU Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workspace. Her work focuses on California Indians, decolonization, and social and environmental justice. Her book, We Are Dancing for You, Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies, received the best first book award in Native American and Indigenous Studies at the annual Native American Indigenous Studies Association Conference in 2019. Dr. Risling Baldi has designed and implemented several grant evaluations for local area tribal organizations for programs in tobacco cessation, youth advocacy, and culturally appropriate evidence-based practices in mental health services. She has led qualitative and quantitative evaluative research on best practices for culturally competent health interventions and designing curriculum for young and adolescent based programming. She has also secured millions of dollars in grant funding for tribal nations and nonprofits throughout Northern California, 
In 2007, Dr. Risling Baldi co-founded the Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit organization that supports the continued revitalization of Native American arts and culture. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our panelists. If you have any questions for our speakers today, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please enjoy this inaugural session of the Food Sovereignty Speaker Series, and thank you all so much for coming. Yay, am I going first? Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. Hey, young Kilek, Kutcha Risling Baldi, Ahoyet. I um, am Dr. Kutcha Risling Baldi. I am the department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. I'm also Hoopa Yark and Karuk, uh, enrolled in the Hoopa Valley tribe. And uh, I'm pleased to be here today with two of the students who worked uh, alongside many of the other students in my Indigenous Natural Resource Management Practices course to bring together a proposal for the implementation, the design and implementation of a food sovereignty lab and cultural workshop space at Humboldt State University. Uh, I have been at Humboldt State now for I think just over five years and um, I'm really pleased with what we've been able to dream about here at HSU and then the ways in which those things are coming to into being. Uh, I do a lot of my work in community and I, I think that because I'm from the communities that are from this area, it's always been really important to me that I find a way that I can bring students into a discussion about the work that they can do in community and the ways that they can make a difference. So I'm gonna start off today by telling you a little bit about um, food sovereignty in this region and food sovereignty in this area. And then uh, really to sort of hopefully set context for you about how this project came to be. And then I'm gonna let Cody and Carrie kind of tell you a little bit more about the project specifically. So I grew up in this region. Uh, in Hoopa, when we talk about like ourselves and, and introduce ourselves, we will often introduce ourselves by telling you about our families and where we're from and where we grew up. And one of the things that I am very interested in, uh, especially after having grown up like with my family, is that we in Hoopa are really tied to our food and our cultural ways of knowing through eating. And when I was growing up, when I was younger, my mom, she would always make a real effort to make sure that uh, every fall we would go and gather acorns. And I didn't, I mean, like as a young person sort of growing up in this contemporary space and culture, right? Um, I, it was actually quite uh, annoying to have to like spend my days going with my parents up into the hills to like get acorns. I wanted to be like what I thought was like a normal kid. And I couldn't really see why she was having us do this because in my mind, you can just go to the store and get food, right? You can just do all the things that you need to do and you don't need to do these sort of old ways of doing things. And just yesterday, I went with some of my friends and my mom and my dad up into the hills again to gather acorns because now is a good time for doing that. Um, and my mom was sharing about how she was always trying to make sure to bring the like, kids with her from our family, but how every single one of them like would maybe be able to pick up 10 acorns before they just got over it. And then she would be like, well, you have to pick up 10 more and then we'll have lunch. You have to pick up 10 more and then we'll do this. But she still brought the same picnic. Like she just, she packs this little picnic for us and she still did all the same things as when we were little kids. And we sat there and talked about the importance of acorns in our lives. Um, so in Hoopa, when we talk about what it means to be a person, we'll introduce ourselves and we'll say like, I'm Kunyanyan. And what that means is uh, I'm a human being, like I'm, I'm a human being, I'm a person. But what it actually means in Hoopa is uh, I'm an acorn eater. Because what we said is like, you know, if you want to be a human being, you have to eat acorns. That's like fundamental to who we are. And that's fundamental to how we, you know, become like human beings. And I love it on a philosophical level because I always think about the ideas that indigenous peoples don't just think of human beings as how we think of like human beings, right? Like bipedal walking, talking individuals. Uh, but they're saying like to be human, to exist in this world in as human, you eat acorns. And there are other beings that, you know, are part of 
our relatives that eat acorns. Deers eat acorns, squirrels eat acorns, right? And so the, that gives you a sense of like our understanding of humanity as so much broader than just what we think of as human beings now. And it ties us all together across acorns. So when we gather acorns, what I also like to tell people is like acorns teaches you that there's a community that cares about you, or there's a person at least in your life that really cares about you because it takes a long time to get from acorn to soup. And it takes a lot of process and care. You have to gather multiple acorns you have to dry them. You have to make sure that you keep stirring them up so that they don't get like moldy or wet. You have to crack them. You have to clean them. You have to grind them and sift them and grind them again. Then you have to leach them. Then you have to store them. Like there's all this whole process before you get to the part where someone's handing you the acorn soup that you're about to eat. And there's so much care that went into that process and so much time and energy that you can't help but feel cared for as a person when they give you your acorn soup. And we like to teach that to people because we wanna remind people that sometimes what we lose is our connection to community that comes through food, but that our indigenous ways of doing that really reminded us that that connection was so important to maintaining how we lived in this world together so that we took care of each other, so that we cared about each other. Now I will say this like about acorns is um, they used to be like so plentiful and even today we're very fortunate like in our area we do have lots of spaces where we can still go get acorns. Uh, in Across California people eat different kinds of acorns. Uh, you won't see the same acorns like in different regions uh, and that's okay. And one of the things that I love about us thinking about ourselves as acorn eaters is it also uh, allowed us to think about the world and how they, it was both different and connected across borders, across regions, across areas of living? Because we were all acorn eaters, even though we ate different kinds of acorns. Some of us ate black oak acorns, right? Some of us ate white oak acorns. In this area, we eat tan oak acorns. And so even though we were different from each other in the type of acorns we ate, we were all acorn eaters. And I think about that as California Indian people really theorizing and understanding what it means to live here in this space together, how we are both connected and different, thinking about the ways in which our food informs the areas that we live, but then how we connect across those foods. Because we would share our acorns with people. We would have gatherings where we would eat different types of acorns and acorn things. So you could really see like a social life developing around this. One of the things that I sort of think about too, though, is that with colonization, there was a big attack on acorns on top of everything else. And what you saw was that with the restrictions that came from colonial mentalities about who native people were supposed to be, they really went after our acorns because they knew that that was our staple food. That's what held us together as people. That's what made us Kunyatyan. And so you see them making restrictions on things like cultural burning, which affects the ways that our oaks grow, which affects the ways that our acorns are and our ability to get at that food. You see them making restrictions about gathering, about going up into the hills. You see it at a point becoming very dangerous to be a person who would go into that area to get acorns because you might be confronted with someone who wanted to hurt you or kidnap you or take you away. In the 1850s, they passed a law the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which was a law passed so that they could legalize the enslavement of native people in California and also legalize their genocide. And there was a period of time in the 1850s where if you were an Indian person who was um, standing around, they could arrest you and take you before the justice of the peace. And if the justice of the peace found you guilty, they would tell you that you had to pay a fine. And if you couldn't pay that fine, and likely you couldn't as a native person, they would sell you, the person, anybody else that was in that room that wanted to pay your fine could effectively purchase you as what they called an apprentice. And so they were creating a system of slavery at this time. They also made it legal so that if you found Indian children with no parents, you could take them to the justice of the peace and have them declared your apprentice. 
And we have to remind ourselves that the easiest way to find an Indian child with no parents is to kill the parents. And this was not a secret. People would often tell people, and there you can read letters from people saying, I found this man and he had several Indian children. And I asked him where he got them. And he said, well, they have no parents. I'm taking them to register them as my apprentice. And I said, how do you know they have no parents? And he said, because we just killed all of their parents. So we're creating a system like the 1850s is creating the system where it's very, very dangerous to be a native person anywhere. Because if you get arrested there, it is likely that you're going to be sold into slavery in California. What this means is that some of our materials are, are the ways in which we practice things like gathering acorns likely became a very dangerous pursuit, something that we couldn't really do, but also something that we couldn't do intergenerationally the way that we had before. We couldn't take our kids out with us to do gathering because our kids were the ones being targeted. We couldn't take our women out to gather because our women were the ones being targeted. And so suddenly you see a change in how these practices are being done. And what I always say to people is that does not mean that we changed our minds about the importance of acorns. It doesn't mean that we suddenly thought they're right and we're wrong. Um, I don't like the language where people say you lost, right? You lost your culture. You lost your ability to do this. You lost your food knowledge. We didn't lose anything. Uh, it was violently wrested away from us by colonization. It was taken on purpose. And we always have to use that language because it's not us that lost. It's that it was, it was violently taken from us. And it helps us to acknowledge that the work that we did to carry on that knowledge is so important. Because even though they made it dangerous for us to do these practices, we still did them. We still ate acorns. We still made sure that we gathered and passed on that information. And it might look a little bit different than it did, but it was because of the, the ways that we had to make decisions about what would keep us safe. Now, there was also a point uh, where the Bureau of Indian Affairs actually came in and they were trying to make policy to decide how they could better assimilate Native people. And they were saying like, what's the, what's the quickest way that we could start to assimilate Native people? And they really went after their food. And you see this throughout the United States, uh, policies and processes of, of tearing down like um, the corn, beans and squash gardens, right? On the East Coast policies and processes of like tearing down the ways people were doing their own agriculture. And in California, you see policies and processes being written about the proposal by which to completely cut down and eradicate oak trees in California in order to keep people from their acorns. And part of that was their belief that that somehow would make us assimilate faster. So they knew that food was so important to how we came together as a community. Now, even with that proposal and those things and the fact that they actually did tear down a number of oak trees throughout the region of California, you still see native people really saying, no, acorns are important to who we are and making sure that with every generation, they find some way to pass acorns on to their people. And this to me shows you that food sovereignty has always been a part of the way that we understand our place in this world. This is who, we're supposed to be. We're acorn eaters. And that's something important about who we will become and how we will be able to sustain this world into the future. Acorns are there for you when you need them. They make sure that nobody is starving. They make sure that everybody has enough, right? There's always a way in which you can provide for people. And these were the fundamental ways that we approach things. Now, in the 1700s with the missionaries, when the Spanish missions came in, they also outlawed native people from Southern California from being able to use acorns. And they told them that acorns were pig food. They were beneath human beings. And they outlawed them being able to use acorns within their everyday lives. And at a point, there was a point where the missionaries, uh, the Franciscan missionaries, were attempting to sort of separate indigenous peoples from their foods because they thought at that point they would be able to get control of them and assimilate them if they could take their foods away from them. And there was one point where they insisted that Indian people could only become um, uh, monocultural like agri agriculture. Like that was the way they had to go to prove that they were civilized. They had to go into monocultural agriculture and they really wanted them to grow corn. 
And they were like, and they were in California saying, you have to grow corn. That's the thing that will make you civilized. That's what you have to do. Now, this is an incredibly ironic statement on the part of the Franciscan missions, because it was actually native people that taught them to grow corn. And corn is indigenous to the Americas. So looking at them saying, this is what makes you civilized, you can see their sort of disconnect from this idea that like they were taught by native people how to grow corn. And it's really, really important to like who native people are in these different regions. And in California, the California natives said to them, corn is great, but it's not gonna work very well here. We need to be in consideration of our soil, our environment, the ways in which things work together. And corn doesn't work as well in this region. It actually might cause more problems because it requires all of these things. So native people as scientists, right, are looking at it and saying, this doesn't, this doesn't make a lot of sense. That's why we have acorns. Acorns are here. It's kind of the same type of staple food. And they tried to tell them like, hey, this isn't really gonna work. But the Franciscan missionaries would not hear of it. They could not hear that indigenous peoples might have more knowledge about this land. So they told them, no, you have to grow corn. And in the period of time where they tried to grow corn, it didn't work. And several people were like ended up starving in the missions. And the California Indians came to the missionaries and they were like, look, we could eat acorns and then we'll all be fine. They're, they're, they're there, they're there for us. And the, the Padres at the time said, no, we will never eat acorns. It's beneath us. It's beneath us to eat that and that they would rather starve. So the idea of California Indian people coming together to make sure that their acorns continued, even though you have all of these pressures from each side is so, so important. And our disconnect from that type of food uh, is demonstrative of the fact that they really tried to take that away from us. So now what you see here, what you see today in our region is a reconnection, a way for us to see like how important acorns are to us. And I love this about our youth and our young people, but about our elders and how much they center our indigenous foods in what they're trying to pass on. And in a program that I'm involved with right now at Two Feathers Native American Family Services, we have made it a point to make acorns a part of every lunch meal that we serve in this program. Because we want the youth to get used to eating acorns again. And when we begin this process with them, we'll often explain to them what I explained to you. It takes a long time for people to get these acorns to you. It shows you that someone cares about you that someone wants you to eat healthy and eat well. It tells you about your environment and the place that you come from, that it can care for you so long as you care for it, and that you have to be just as gentle with it as it is with you. It sustains you in times when maybe you might have nothing else, and it is healthy in every way possible. There's nothing artificial, there's nothing that's going to hurt your body, and in fact, it's going to make you feel better. And all of that comes from this food, this moment. And then we explain to them that like our taste buds today and who we are today might not taste it as well because we're used to artificial flavoring and coloring. We're used to like extra flavoring in the things that we do, the things that we eat. So when we first eat it, it may taste foreign to us or different or not what we expected it to taste like. But we explain to our youth, it's really important to approach these acorns in a healthy, happy way so that you don't go into it thinking, ew, it's gross and I don't like it and I have to tolerate it. But instead, I'm open to it and I'm going to think about what it brings to me and how important it is. And we always say, be grateful for your acorns, be grateful for your food. And I love watching the young people reconnect with these acorns because at first, many of them are hesitant or a little bit like scared that of what it will taste like. When they realize what it tastes like, they get a little bit like, well, it's not quite what I, what I would think of when I think of like food and how food's supposed to taste. But by the end of it, we have so many young people by the end of these weeks that we do this with them who will constantly say to us, it's lunchtime. When are we going to start with our acorns? How are we going to eat our acorns? When are you going to tell us about the acorns? And they see this really important to connection to our place, our history, our people and the ways in which we are reconnecting now and how important that is. And so I'm telling you this because I want you to know, like we've been fighting this fight for food sovereignty for at least 150 years. 
of trying to remind ourselves like why it's so important to carry this knowledge forward. And we have these moments where we have to remind ourselves that our elders, our ancestors, they did whatever it took to bring that knowledge forward because they were up against some of the most horrific situations that people could face. And then it also reminds us that they have been through these things and relied on their food and on their acorns and on their salmon and on their peoples that have always taken care of them because they lived through pandemics and they lived through colonization and they lived through genocide. And, and yet each one of them said, I'm gonna take this piece forward and I'm gonna pass it on to the next person because our next generations have to have it too. And if they could just remember one part of it, they put that part forward. So when I think about the work we're doing in food sovereignty now at Humboldt State in Native American studies, it's because I, I know the importance of what we could do to contribute to these moments, these incredible moments of survivance and resiliency and reconnection and decolonization. And what happened was, I, I, I want my students to feel like they can do that, that they can make this difference, right? That they can come in and really do something meaningful. And what I love about Humboldt State students is when you do a talk to them or you teach them in a class, every single class ends with the same question. What can I do? Tell me what to do and I'll do it. What can I do? And so for the Indigenous Natural Resource Management Practices course, which I teach and uh, we do it every fall, last year I came to them as a group of students and I said, let's find out something we can do. Let's make something we can do to address some of these issues that we're learning about. And we cover so much in the class. We cover uh, cultural burning, we cover fish, we cover water issues, we cover basketry. We look at the ways in which how we understand natural resource management really informs what happens with like cultural resiliency and survival. And we talk about like, if we're gonna be people working in the community, if we're gonna be people working in organizations that have to do with natural resource management, if we're gonna be people in the sciences, how do we understand that this is also about tribal communities, tribal peoples, right? Tribal youth. And then how do we understand that no, none of these issues, these issues that are a direct result of colonization and capitalism that has sort of infected this place that none of them can be addressed without indigenous knowledges. You're not going to solve climate change without Native American studies. You're not going to be able to make different programs or address the issues that we're coming up against without indigenous studies. So when we think about it that way, what can we do? And I gave the students lots of leeway to think about how they wanted to approach that. What can we do? And out of that came a research project that lasted an entire semester that included outreach to several different community members, to indigenous students, faculty, staff. It also resulted in a stakeholders meeting and a discussion. It was a way for them to approach how they could envision something that could happen on this campus that could make a real difference for how we understand our role and what this is going to look like in the future. And after months of research, outreach, surveys, coding, responses, community stakeholders meetings, discussions, and, and even just flat out dreaming together amongst each other and with me, what came to fruition was the HSU Native American Studies Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workshop Space. And I couldn't be prouder of the group of students who did this work because people often think like when they meet, when they talk to me about it, they'll say, this must have been mostly you, right? And then the students sort of like helped you do it. And then you did, it was not, it was the students. And I was there to kind of tell them things that they could do, but their motivation to get things done, to make things happen is the reason why we're here today. And I could not have, see, I, I, I could not have envisioned what this would have become but I will tell you that now that the students have put all that work into it, all that time, energy, and effort, I'm not gonna let it stop at just a dream. And it's not even gonna be like just the one thing. It's, this is gonna build so much for what we can do, especially at this university. Because a lot of times people will ask me like, 
you do all this work on decolonization, right? And you do all this work on like thinking about what the future could look like. And, and then you're in this institution. And I'm like, I'm in this institution for a couple of reasons. One is because I believe we need to be able to take the resources of the institution and do what we need to do in our communities in a way that really matters. And two, because of these students. And I have never um, been so sustained in my own life of what it could look like, what this future could look like, than when I have been working with students who truly want to find some way to make, make impossible things possible. And what I will say to you is uh, people always say, like when we start dreaming about what a decolonized future looks like, when we start dreaming about land return, when we start dreaming about a food sovereignty lab, when we start dreaming about all of this, many people's first instinct is to say to me, I don't know, Kacha, that seems pretty impossible. And then I will say to them, you know, in my short life, in my short time, here right now in this place, I can tell you that in my own lifetime, I have seen impossible things happen. I have seen the return of Tuluat to the Wiat people, the center of the world. Something that they were told was impossible is now possible and has happened. So I look forward to the visions of the students that help me to make impossible things possible and then make them happen. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Cody and Carrie so they can tell you a little bit more about the story in the lab. And then I'll come back at the end to share a few things too. Uh, but I wanna say two things about Cody and Carrie first. Um, first of all, they're two amazing students. And I just wanna remind you, like they are amazing. They're students who are working through this, who are just powerful voices for this lab and this food sovereignty center. And there are many times in my own like um, career throughout this now working on this process that if I wouldn't have had Cody and Carrie, I don't know, maybe at a point I probably would have felt like it was something I couldn't get done, but Cody and Carrie would come in and be like, nope, we're gonna do this now, we're gonna do this. And they just make things happen. So I think I have to thank them for their role in how they've been able to push this process forward. Chikanik, thank you so much, Kacho. What an <laughs> amazing introduction. Yagali um, do, everyone. Eshalon Cody Henriksen. Um, I was born and raised in Alaska, but I have spent um, the last decade of my life here in Goudini. Um, I have a very personal connection to this place. Um, even s many of the native languages in this area have similar language bases as my own native language and we have very similar traditions and ideas and all that stuff so i i feel very honored to be here and in connection with this land and this place and its people um and i'll let carrie introduce herself thank you so much to caitlin and katja and cody um yeah, I'm, I'm really honored to be on this panel today with this team. Um, we'll tell you all about kind of how we got here, but I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge my white privilege as um, I have mixed European heritage, predominantly Ashkenazi Jew, and then I was adopted um, and raised by a family outside of Boston um, that were Irish and Armenian settlers. And then 13 years ago, <laughs> I can't believe it's been that long, but 13 years ago, transplanted myself in California um, I think it's really important for me to make that known that I work with this incredible team, but I am um, of mixed European settler descent. And um, I'm just really, really honored to be here. Um, I'm gonna get started. And Cody, are you going to share your screen so we can do the slides? Okay. All right. So okay. just the title of our presentation today is just Imagining Indigenized Campus, and this was the original title of when we had submitted it um, in numerous fashions and to the CSU research competition. And it's all just, the study is all just about um, reflecting on an Indigenous student body within HSU and how that actually manifests itself physically. Um, so in the fall of 2019, our Indigenous Natural Resource Management class um, headed by Dr. Risley Baldi, imagined a research project that would have lasting benefits for our community. 
Um, so Cody and I and the rest of our classmates helped design this first phase of, well, I, yeah, all of the phases of the project. We couldn't have done it without our classmates. Um, and there's still um, several people that we work with on the Food Sovereignty Lab steering committee that are from our class as well. So we still all work um, pretty closely together. Um, and it's important to mention that this project is intrinsically dis interdisciplinary. The, um, the students in the class spanned, I think it was 12 um, majors from across campus. And um, collectively, we kind of came up with this idea of, you know, like, how are we going to indigenize um, HSU's campus? And so really, um, when we came about this question in class, we were kind of just like, well, what can we do as a class, you know, to improve our community, specifically the native community within HSU? Um, and really in order to do that, we had to understand that community. So part of that was just getting out and actually doing interviews. Um, and because indigenous peoples are often left out of the conversation, we decidedly prioritize those voices within our research. And specifically our research asked what indigenous representations did HSU and other CSUs already have on campus? What additions are essential to an indigenous student body? And how could we grow those representations on campus to better and support our indigenous community on campus and in the surrounding ones? Um, Cody, do you want to keep talking about this slide? Yeah, and so this slide here really just explains, it's just a little model of how we went about our research through participatory action. Um, we did interviews of HSU faculty, staff, and students. We also researched campuses um, across the CSU system to look for examples of um, you know, services and also like art installations or programs or gardens or anything really to do with um, their native communities. So once we kind of knew um, what we were working towards um, on campus, we started to identify the current indigenous representations that we have here. And some of the things that um, are coming up on, on the slide here um, were the things that we found. So we have ITEP and Intercept, um, and then some of the um, infrastructure and cultural representations, which are pretty minimal, um, but we do have some that we wanted to point out, which you see in the pictures here. The first is um, the Europe canoe that's in the um, library. And then the picture on the right is the Native American Forum, which is um, inspired by a traditional longhouse. And inside the Native American Forum, which you'll see a picture later on in the presentation that has um, the mural that's sitting in inside the, um, the lobby of the Native American Forum. And the rest of the forum has been, I think it was just last year that they kind of like built it out and um, designed it and added all this incredible stuff. And there's some redwood stools that were made by Almi Allen. Um, the mural is painted by Lynn Risling. Um, there's basket weave designs engraved in the windows. There are dolls that are dressed in like traditional regalia. Um, I think the story of how the Native Forum got to be there is in there, a copy of Kutch's book, photo case. There's just a bunch of really incredible stuff. So next time you're able to actually go into campus and you can um, kind of walk through there, I highly recommend taking a look. And this table here is just a small list of uh, what we did find on HSU's campus. It's not exhaustive, but as you can see, it's pretty minimal, um, which really influenced a lot of our decision making and the fact that we, we wanted a, a physical space on campus. And that was what we ended up hearing a lot actually in interviews. So um, another part of our research was to kind of explore what other campuses in California had, um, like the CSU or um, UC systems like uh, on their campuses. And some of the more impressive representations that we found were the Fresno State's Peace Garden, which consists of six plants used in the making of Native American baskets and utilizes a basket weave theme throughout the garden. And then the um, Creekside Education Garden at Chico State, which has native species and signs, which indicate the common name, scientific name, and sometimes the Machupta name of those plants. And so we got some pretty good ideas from the stuff that we found on other campuses. Um, but as you'll kind of come to see, um, 
there wasn't really anything that came close to kind of this, this plan that we've been developing. So then a really major part of our research was to actually go out within our own community. And so part of that was we held a community stakeholders meeting where we invited in um, people from our community, tri local tribal members, uh, students, staff, um, indigenous, non-indigenous alike, while we did prioritize indigenous voices. We also conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with faculty and staff. Um, just because not everyone could make stakeholders meetings. And um, eventually uh, this, this meeting, uh, also the stakeholders meeting gave our class uh, the opportunity to um, get a lot more feedback with the ideas we were developing. Because at this point we were starting to develop that we did, we kind of wanted some sort of space for cultural uh, material making, basket regalia, medicine, um, something of that nature was starting to really like solidify at this point. And here, this is just um, kind of some of those, we ended up coding the responses uh, we got to look for unifying themes without it. And really what kind of came out was that we wanted us, there was a, they needed a centralized space for um, Native American studies in general, because as you'll find it's been very spread out on campus, even though originally that was not the intent. Um, and just a lot of things like more information on, you know, how people of this area lived their lives and continue to live within relation to the land and to have a space for that really. And so based on these findings, uh, what we ended up proposing was the Food Sovereignty Lab, which was kind of encompassing everything we ended up really hearing. Um, and so what we really wanted this space to be was a space for traditional ecological knowledge workshops, a place for basket regalia and medicine making, and to prepare indigenous food um, for to practice our indigenous food sovereignty as students, peoples, and a collective community as well. And so actually, and then one of the last phases of that research was that we actually did take our proposal to the California Association of Indian faculty and staff um, just to kind of get a last like approval of if they thought our methodologies were sound and that what we we're working towards was actually reflective of indigenous voices within the university and community. And we got the go ahead. <laughs> Carrie, you want to talk about the competition? Yeah, sure. Um, so as was mentioned before, um, Cody and I, so every year CSU has um, a student-led research competition and um, we came across it and we're like, you know, we should, we should just enter in this competition because this is like, we've already done all the research, you know, Cody and I had become a little, pretty familiar with um, doing this presentation for people and so um, we thought it was really important to kind of get the the word out, like, and get, you know, see how kind of like the community was going to um, get behind this. And little show. did we know what we signed up for, though. I had no idea. Because <laughs> um, this was all we signed up pre COVID. And so <laughs> um, things changed drastically. I think we were, we were scheduled to go down to um, CSU East Bay on like a bus with all of the other people who were presenting and like spend a couple of days in a hotel down in Oakland or Hayward or wherever it was. And, um, and then COVID happened. And so <laughs> we all kind of were told that we have to figure out a way of doing this online. And there were only, most of the people who, or most of the students who had submitted um, their research for this were individuals. And so there were only a couple, I think there were one of two um, groups from HSU. And so finding a way in the very early days of COVID-19 to like, you know, make a joint presentation recorded online virtually and submitting it <laughs> prior to the deadline was very interesting. Um, but Cody and I worked really, really hard on it. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better partner in this. I mean, it was, it was wild trying to organize it um, around both of our schedules and um, all of the things that we had going on. But 
We and just trying to record that 10 minute video without a mess up. It was wild. I mean, we had a great time though. It was fun. Um, many late nights and um, yeah, we were not like, you know, surprised. We were, we were surprised, but we didn't, we kind of like had high hopes for what this would get, um, you know, would get recognition um, for this research. And so we ended up getting second place in the graduate level behavior sciences um, category. And it was just a really, really exciting thing to be able to bring back to the other students and to catch and see like, check it out, all of this hard work, like we're being recognized and, um, you know, we even won some money and we donated it to the lab <laughs> right. and that it was it was a really great experience um it was really awesome we ended up uh but it ended up becoming a really interesting experience after we left the competition because when we came well when we came back to hsu uh we were being praised on every humble state university social media for oh look at these great students you know doing this amazing work and at the meantime, we were actually really kind of miffed about this because currently beyond the the competition, we were in the means of trying to get a we had submitted a request for space um, to get this going. And so simultaneously, while the university is praising us for our work, we were also like being ignored on the work we were doing at a at a bureaucratic level. So, and then Carrie can talk to you a little bit about that process here. So the images that you see are the space that we um, apply. So any space that you want to um, utilize on campus has to go through the University Space and in Facilities Advisory Committee. Um, so th this is the space that we applied for, which is uh, formerly known as the Hilltop Marketplace. It's been vacant and um, and it just so happens that this location is really perfect because it's right next to the Native Forum. It's in the, the same building, in fact, and just across the way from Goudini Gallery and the Native American Studies Depart Department in the main BSS building. So it's like a central spot for, um, for this kind of a project. And so we submitted this application to USFAC. We waited months to hear back from them um, and to like figure out, to find out the status of this application. And um, after many attempts to kind of contact the committee about what was going on, we were told that it had been denied um, months earlier without receiving notice of that. Um, we were cited COVID-19 as um, like the reason why we didn't hear back, but I think it happened in February that they denied our request and, um, you know, COVID shelter in place started in the middle of March. So there was that. Um, we were also denied because they said this space wouldn't be an inclusive space for all people across campus um, to use and wouldn't meet the standards of our space request. Um, and that um, this space was highly sought after, even though it hadn't been used in a year. It was like this highly sought after space. So they had to like consider other applications that didn't even exist. <laughs> so it was very confusing, very stressful. Um, and again, like Cody was saying, it was like on one side, on, on one hand, we were being praised by the university for this um, really hard, this great research that our that our um, class did, and the presentation and everything that we did for the competition, um, but being denied the space at the exact same time on the other hand. So it was very confusing and stressful and angering. Um, and so the students kind of didn't give up. And I'll let Cody kind of take over from there. But we we yeah. didn't think this is a sign of like. Okay, game over. I guess we're done. We kind of decided to take it as an opportunity to figure out how we were actually going to get the space that we wanted. Yeah, and so something why this space was so key to why we wanted this space um, beyond that it's centrally located within Native American Studies. It's across from Goudini Gallery. It's next to the Native American Forum, which really centralizes Native American Studies to have there. One of the main reasons we really wanted this space, it came to our attention that this space oris originally was actually designated for this, for a cultural workspace basketry regalia making spot. And through a bunch of bureaucratic tape and taking little by little, a classic story HSU has had with Native American stories, the space was taken away from the program and it was turned into the Hilltop Marketplace, which ultimately failed uh, miserably 
as no one cared for energy drinks and stuff, um, you know, overpriced, you know, junk food is really all that they sold. And it closed and stayed vacant for a year. And so we're like, oh, perfect. Let's apply for it. We were denied. And then so after, you know, learning of, you know, kind of how we were pushed around with the decision, we decided to, um, we started researching um, the actual bylaws of the committee that denied us and looking at like, you know, do they actually have this authority? Um, and as we read into all their bylaws and um, how they organize themselves as a committee, we found huge gaps in procedure, just nothing was articulated how you would go about things within the committee itself. You know, one person would tell us, oh, we can do this. And then another person would be like, oh, wait, no, we can't. So within the community, they didn't even have a clear understanding of their own structure or power or authority. And so we decided that through this, we couldn't trust the steering committee to do a job that they were supposed to do. Um, and we didn't feel we could trust them to do it without racial bias because we were cited that this wouldn't be an inclusive space for all and which sounds purely they based that because we said it was going to be a native american studies lab which i don't understand why that would have to only include native american students when any student can take those classes yeah <laughs> the majority of students taking those classes aren't native and so we actually ended up taking five students, Dr. Kutcher Riesling Bottom and Dr. Kutcher Riesling Baldy and Adam Cantler, the natural resource specialist for the Wiat tribe. Um, we all did testimonies in front of the HSU Senate one after another and described, you know, our why we were so upset, upset with this process, you know, and the overt racial bias that they were like pressing on us. And, um, you know, we had really passionate testimonies. Like I started to tear up at one point when talking about salmon, you know, and when they started deliberating, you know, all they could, t they were like, yes, we support your ideals, but you know, we have to think about the process. You know, we have to think about, you know, our laws and this, these standards and what precedent this sets for other people. So on one hand, they're telling us, oh, yes, you're right. This this is a good thing. But on the other hand, they're slapping it away. And so after a really big heated back and forth, we got a very confusing answer at the end, which was like that. The original denial got withdrew and so then got approved and then we were approved conditionally. And one of those conditions being that we had to fund the lab entirely on our own, which I don't know every lab's story on HSU's campus, but I would be pretty certain to say there's not a single lab on campus that hasn't received funding from HSU to be implemented and to get run. You know, what is this university if it's not, you know, <laughs> supporting its classes and its students? And so after meeting the standards of the U university, we set forward with the creation of a steering committee because we counted this as win, we got our space and we moved forward. So I guess bringing it to kind of present-ish, Touch is gonna give you the latest updates, which are extremely exciting. Um, but basically the steering com committee has been formed by um, some students faculty and staff on campus and community members as well who, um, you know, have interest in this project, but also probably like a lot of times, or a lot of them bring kind of like um, expertise in, in this field, um, which is really incredible to work with all of the people on our team um, and hear like the insight and perspectives and everything that's um, kind of taken place so far. So far. And over the next two years, we're going to be doing more focusing on planning and development of the lab. Um, and right now, we are working on fundraising, which is a huge deal. And um, we just received a grant from Hyfe um, for $80,000, thanks to the hard work of one of our classmates and the Food Sovereignty Lab Research Assistant, Amanda McDonald. And um, we are trying to reach the goal of $250,000 as soon as possible so we can really like get everything kind of put in and um, designed and done so we can get in there and start utilizing the space. Um, and I'm going to just stop with that because I know that Kutcha is going to go into more details. I don't want to say too much, but um, 
It is important to note that we're not the first, nor will we be the last group of people to work towards decolonizing or indigenizing this campus and community. Um, and we wanna like recognize the people that have been already working on these types of things for a very, very long time. Um, we just hope that this project will be an extension of the ongoing decolonization work that is desperately needed across the world. Um, and we hope that this Food Sovereignty Lab will um, set precedent for schools in California and across the nation to focus on the integration of Native American studies and decolonial practices that will that will improve all of our lifestyles. Um, so that being said, I'm going to pass it off to Katja for her to kind of. Oh wait, I have. I just want to say one more thing before we pass off. I just wanted to note too that um, everyone involved in this. Um, especially the students have put in hours and hours of countless work, you know, late night hours, you know, before, right before deadlines. And what's really amazing about this project, it's, it's a student driven project. And it is something that students at HSU saw, dreamt about and wanted, you know, in, in my culture, in Denina culture, we, we talk about dreamers. We, dreamers are very important figures in our community. They're leaders, you know, and we, we, we like to dream, you know, because that's how we imagine better things for ourselves. And also, you know, we, we put a lot of power to that, you know, and it's also a Denina saying that, you know, if someone wants to be something or create something, they just have to dream it and to believe in it. And then that thing will come to be. And that has really happened. You know, this really is a dream of the students of HSU and everyone that's been involved. And it's just, it's such an amazing thing to know. Like, I really hope anyone who's watching knows that this is something, you know, we came to a classroom and decided to do. You know, we created this through our pure will. <laughs> and I just like to say, Chikanik, um, thank you so much. And I also like to leave you with one of my favorite uh, Danaina phrases, which is Nagihi Nadeninu, which means the tide is coming in. And it's like a saying we say for like, good things are happening and you can't stop them. All right, we'll pass thank it off to Kutcha now. Thank you, thank you both. I, um, I wanted to mention a couple things in case people missed it while they were talking. First is, they did get second place in the student research competition and then received some uh, award money because of that and uh, turned around and donated that money to the Food Sovereignty Lab. So I think the dedication of the students to me has always been pretty pretty amazing. And uh, I just cannot believe how like excited they are about this you know, potential project coming into being. I wanted to give everybody a very quick update about where we are right now. So now that you know sort of like the history and how it came to be and the fight that the students had to be able to make sure that they secured the space and just knowing that they dedicated their time to that in the midst of the the first lockdown and the COVID pandemic and the fact that their classes were changing to online, they would meet for several hours via Zoom, they would write, work on letters, they would work on outreach. We had over 100 letters of support that were written within like a two week time period in support of this project from people from all over the place, all over campus. We had a resolution passed by the Associated Students that was written by some of the people working on our project saying we're in support of this project. So we see like, we see so much support that came and we cannot think enough. And this is something I think that to me has always been such an important part of the story is how supported we were by the Wiat tribe and the Wiat tribe you know, agreeing to come and send a representative to the meeting with the students when they were testifying in front of the Senate and the Wiat tribe stepping up and saying that this is something that they could really support on their land, land that, you know, we occupy at HSU. I think, uh, I think that meant the world to the students, to us, that they showed up, that they said like, this is a project we want to see happen. So we have to thank um, Adam and we have to thank the Wiat tribe for being there and sending a letter and saying, this is something that we can support. Uh, to give you all an update about where we are right now, I'm going to share my screen and um, let you know that, so we we are working right now on the fundraising side of um, our project. We need to raise a total of $250,000 to make our remodeling happen. Uh, we have re secured a grant through the Humboldt Energy Independence Fund, which is a student-run fund at Humboldt State. 
who uh, just granted us $80,000 toward this project. And this is very significant. It's one of our biggest and first donations that have happened toward this project. For the entire remodel to happen, which will institute something really important on this campus, it was going to take around $250,000, which we're currently working on. If you look at the site map and plan, one thing that, that you know, we've been very clear is that the area in which this place is located is so important, very near the Native American Forum, which you see over here, a gathering space for peoples of the community to be able to come and learn more uh, about Native peoples. It's modeled after a traditional uh, Native house from this region. It is uh, significant that students uh, at a point occupied the Native American Forum to keep it as the Native American Forum. So this area, again, is incredibly significant to who we are on the HSU campus, but also the ways in which we're able to outreach to the community. We also have over here the Goutdini Gallery. Uh, this is uh, a gallery that is only focused on Native artists and Native artwork. It's the only gallery really of its kind on um, like a CSU campus where it's just a Native focused gallery. And it has some of the like just the most amazing shows that come to that area. So I think that that's also very important. We have here the lobby to the Native American Forum, which is um, a really amazing, like the Native American Studies Department worked to revitalize the lobby to include murals and installations. And so it's a space that people can come into. They can learn more about Native peoples, Native programs, and the Native, the, the, the Native artwork that's on campus. In fact, my background is actually one of the murals done by Jessica Slayton, uh, who is an alumni of HSU. Um, and it is actually in the Native American Forum lobby. So you can go once campus reopens and visit it and see it in person. And then you also have here, uh, this would be the location of the Food Sovereignty Lab. Again, very near Goudini Gallery, the Native American Forum, the lobby, this out, this potential outdoor space for what we're going to be doing with a salmon cooking pit and processing area. And then you also have surrounding the Native American Forum, and this is right now, a native plants garden to California. And so all around this area, you already have planted native plants. And so you see the ways in which we're able to tie in this, this area very specifically to something pretty powerful in terms of representation on our campus. I have taken to calling this area We at Plaza. It's not official yet, but I feel like if I just start calling it We at Plaza, everybody will just start calling it We at Plaza, and then it'll become We at Plaza, and then we can all just call it a day. Um, so that is like shows you a little bit about the site plan. Now, if you look specifically into the re the redo and what we're planning for this area, you have the outdoor gathering and food processing preparation, where we will have areas where people can work with uh, different things that need to be done outdoors, specifically because of maybe how messy they are, because we can move the tables actually outdoors to bring people outside. We will be converting this area into a fire and smoking pit so that we can do salmon cooking and we can do eel cooking and we can actually give people the space to be able to interact with how we do things in this region that I think is very important. Um, and then you have inside the space, we will have a full commercial kitchen with uh, the ability to live stream or to document like what's happening. So we'll be able to have a big setup with technology so people can actually watch demonstrations that are happening even if they're not there. We can record them for use later and we can um, broadcast to other areas in case not everybody can be in the space if there's too many people that want to be in there but can't be. We have movable tables so that we can actually move around and make them uh, in whatever configuration we see fit, a uh, food preparation area, uh, freezers and refrigerators, um, areas for which people can uh, do work. And then we'll actually be adding in a door so we can do indoor outdoor space, plus storage cabinets and shelving. So it's gonna be a significant space for being able to do this work actually on campus. Now, some other things that I wanted to show you were a few pictures to kind of give you context of where this is. If you've never been to the BSS building at Humboldt State University, the Behavioral and Social Sciences building, it's up at the top of this hill. Uh, it's a large, like tall building. But if you look over off to the side, this is the Native American Forum area, which also includes the store and another lecture hall. And the Native American Forum looks like this, which is this uh, this area right here uh, to meant to look like a traditional house 
uh, in, the, in the Native community. Now I'm gonna share one more part of my screen for you so you can see a little bit about what's going on inside the Native American Forum. Um, if you look here, this is actually photos of inside the space that we have now secured for remodel because we wanted to show you that the money that we're using is really gonna be used to create something that can invite people in to do this work. So the location will be in what is the, called the former, former Hilltop Marketplace, which currently looks like this. These are actually current pictures of the area. Uh, and so we will, the remodel will allow us to replace the flooring, to set up the cooking area as a commercial kitchen, to add in several areas of shelving and cabinetry, places for people to work, places for people to gather, and movable tables so that we can always like be reconfiguring the space so that it can be really accessible to multiple kinds of people. They'll also be adding in a doorway over here on this uh, section of windows so that we can do both an indoor outdoor classroom as necessary. You have here a view of what will become the salmon cooking pit area, uh, the salmon and smoking area. It actually was supposed to be a salmon cooking pit slash smoking like pit area before. But again, after sort of things happened uh, in the university and then they kind of like kept pushing it off and pushing it off, it didn't happen. But now the space is still there to make that happen. And you see down here at the bottom, this is what the, the native plants that are like planted around the Native American Forum are at right now. There is There are several opportunities in this area to create seating areas. We've uh, got plans to create a native foods garden, like in terms of with um, QR codes so that you can scan them and hear the words for the different plants in the Wiat language. We've got plans for installation so that people can interact and understand the plants more. So there's all kinds of ways in which we're gonna bring like a community classroom here to this spaces. Finally, what I wanted to share with you, uh, and this is the last thing that I'll share with you to kind of give you an idea about the work that has gone into um, this space. <clears throat> so aside from our, our physical plans, you have students who have made really important plans for what this means for us as a community. And one of the things that I think students have been very clear about is this is supposed to be a space to where HSU is really being community facing. So we will be holding community workshops, we'll be bringing in cultural practitioners, but also Native American youth, people from the region who we want to inspire, not just to come to HSU and where they can see how HSU will support them as indigenous peoples and students, but also because we want to inspire them to be in higher education, to be in areas with college students, to work with them, to be able to see the ways in which these things can come together. And so it will also be a cultural workshop space that can be utilized by the community and can the community can come in and hold events and things that they would like to do in this space. It's also a cross departmental space. So right now the um, in the uh, Environmental Studies Department. We have a representative on our steering committee from the Environmental Studies Department, and we're getting representatives from other departments who are interested in thinking about how can they work with Native American Studies to make this part of their curriculum and understand like the work that we're doing in Indigenous food sovereignty and how it informs what they're doing in their departments across colleges and across campus. This is actually a food sovereignty lab logic model that was made by a group of our students. And so this is some of the other work that they have been doing to kind of put together how we can understand the role of the food sovereignty lab in what it can become. And this idea of like why it is so important that we're thinking about this on a much bigger level and the, and like who we can be as HSU when we start to think about these community facing projects as both being really important to students, but also coming together and bringing the community on campus to do this work that they are already doing. And this is actually a poster that was made by one of the students so that it told you a little bit about like why this was so important to them, why it's so important to make this happen right now and what they would like to see in a food sovereignty lab on campus. And I will say this, We've been very fortunate with our food sovereignty lab in that we have several uh, resources that are being created so that people can follow up if they would like to. If you go to our YouTube page, the HSU Native American Studies YouTube page, what you will see is several different resources specifically about the food sovereignty lab. There's actually a list that we've created that's just the resources about the food sovereignty lab. You can see Cody and Carrie's actual presentation, their award-winning presentation for their research. You can learn more about our discussion about food sovereignty and about the history of the lab and how it came to be and what we're trying to do today. 
And finally, what I'll say is um, we are very fortunate to have a number of people who have agreed to join our steering committee and who have been working with us at like monthly to be able to talk about what our steering committee is going to do and where we're going to go from there. So we have representatives from several departments, from several tribes, including Blue Lake Rancheria, uh, the Wiat tribe, um, the Paiute, the Bishop Paiute tribe, uh, the Yurok tribe. Um, so we have representatives, oh, and then the Trinidad Rancheria. So we have representatives from across this region who are helping us to make this happen. We've been trying to do this in the best way possible. And I will say this, at this point, like when people say, what can I do to support? I say, we need money. We need the money to come in. It can be as little as $5. It can be as much as $250,000. It can be even more. We need people to get excited, to show excitement for this project by donating, by telling somebody else to donate, by helping us. If you know of a grant or something that's coming up, then you can reach out and say, hey, there's actually this grant I think you should apply for because we, you know, we can't keep track of everything. Uh, and then to also say that this is something that you could see using in your community so that other people can get excited, pass along the things that we've created, pass along our information, because that's what's gonna get people more invested in like what we're doing. And I'll say that in the end, when it comes out and when we do the premiere and when everybody's invited, what I'm really looking forward to are the students who are going to be there. And they're gonna see what happened from the day that we were all in class together. And I said, well, what do you guys wanna do? All the way to here's this food sovereignty lab, which we could not have built without all of these people that stepped forward. Students, community members, tribes, tribal leaders, like uh, all the people in this region that do food sovereignty work, I think, had we not had that, who knows what would have happened with this proposal. But because we have that here in Humboldt, because our native peoples and communities and leaders are so strong, because our native voices are like what are the people are needing to listen to, we are fortunate enough that this, this needs to happen here in Humboldt County, because this is gonna be a leading program. It'll likely be one of the most, like the, one of the cutting edge leading programs of food sovereignty as a food sovereignty lab at a university that we've ever seen. And that will be here at Humboldt State. Um, so we do have time for some questions, if people have questions, but that's where I'm gonna end today with letting you know where we're at right now. Oh, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, that was. That was wonderful, thank you. Um, I wanna tell all of the members of the audience at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. Um, you can put your questions there. Um, and if you are watching live on, our, on Facebook, um, I will be keeping track of your questions as well. So feel free to type a question in the comment on Facebook um, and we will get to it. But I'm the moderator, so I get to start. Um, so I teach like a million freshmen and I'm thinking about them in the audience and they're maybe learning about indigenous food sovereignty for the first time. They may be learning that like, whoa, you can feed a whole bunch of people with acorns for the first time. And so for the folks that are in their very first semester of HSU and they want to become involved in the Food Sovereignty Lab and other projects that focus on indigenous food sovereignty, what is your advice for how they should spend the next four years um, and how they can become involved in the HSU Food Sovereignty Lab? I mean, for Carrie and us, like how we really got involved beyond literally being in the classes, one day we just raised our hand and said we would do it. And so it's like rising to the opportunities given before you. So like when people give you like, you know, land acknowledgements with something to do, go do it, you know, or go, go learn about those people, you know, and like get as involved in your classes as you can. If you take Native American studies classes, that's how I got involved. I just kept asking, what can I do? What can I do? I was going to say something similar, but starting even more basic and Kaylin, it sounds like you know, some of your students who might be here listening are already kind of doing some of the things that I was going to recommend, like take NAS classes, take them with Caitlin, take them with Katja. Like, I mean, it's like Cody said, I wouldn't have been able to be involved in this project if I wasn't taking the classes and didn't raise my hand and wasn't like, yeah, like this is important. This is meaningful. Um, 
you know, we can all kind of say, oh, that sounds like great. And, you know, it's cool that other people are doing this, but to actually do it is so much more fulfilling. And um, there's plenty of opportunities to be involved everywhere. So just start raising your hand, Taking, take the classes and raise your hand. I mean, I would add too, and what I've been starting to say to people is like, if this sounds appealing to you and interesting, why aren't you majoring or minoring in Native American studies? Because uh, this is where this work is happening and like all the time. And if you take the classes with us, then you're gonna get involved with the department. If you get involved with the department, then you're gonna get to do this work, this work that's so important and so meaningful to how we build our futures. And I don't think it should be out of the realm of possibility for people to think about Native American studies as a major or minor that is absolutely complementary to anything that you want to do. And if you're doing another major, also do a major in Native American studies and you will walk out ready to change the world. And then you will have had an opportunity to do so many things that I don't think other people are starting to do yet. And I think what's really beautiful about like our minors, for instance, is you get like a breadth of information and courses but we work so closely with each other that you're always getting to do these types of like information and projects that that we think about because we're so involved with our communities on the ground. Uh, if you want to work right now on the Food Sovereignty Lab, um, you just take Indigenous Natural Resource Management Practices. That's the course where they're doing all of the work to kind of bring things into being. Um, and then if you want to keep working on it, then whenever there's a class like a, a, the, the Tribes of California class works really closely on the Food Sovereignty Lab too. So it's like finding ways to get involved in the classes that are really going to make this their priority. Uh, and then just, I mean, if you, if you write to Caitlin and say, I want to do something, I want to help, well, we can find things for people to do, especially now, because this is, this is really a grassroots movement of students. Uh, I keep saying this to everybody. These students don't get paid to do this. They're not getting units to do this. It's like they're doing this because they believe in it. And I, I admire them that they constantly show up ready and willing to do the work to make this happen. And they keep that energy no matter what. I will say too, to piggyback off of what Kutcha just said, I came to HSU to only be a marine biology major. And then I took an NAS class and I was like, wow, I really like this and now I'm actually double majoring in it um, and but what is so amazing about that is with what I want to do in my community there's not a lot of opportunities to get um, experience in this sort of things but now my CV is popping you know I have so much great stuff on there you know and just because I've been getting involved and putting it forward and now I have these classes and I guarantee you HSU has the top-notch Native American studies program in the nation. I'm constantly in awe of my teachers, my indigenous teachers teaching me indigenous knowledge. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So just be careful if you take one class, you'll probably take two at least. <laughs> oh, thank you all so much. Um, my next question for you, um, I know you guys have the um, mentioned it a bit during all of your remarks, uh, but I want to talk about like student activism um, and kind of give us the lowdown on like what that was really like. And so I'm, my, my questions, um, how did COVID-19 impact your ability specifically to kind of like organize and strategize and like during this very, very crucial decision-making period. And so um, if you could kind of address the way that was an added challenge for you. Um, and also kind of the, if you could address this, why this particular space is so important. Um, you both, you all had mentioned that the, there, there was an occupation of the Native American Forum, um, but if you could provide some more insights on like indigenous resistance on HSU, like historically and why this particular space was so important for this project. Well, I can only speak to the activism that the students and Kacha and Adam helped with um, <laughs> where we, you know, fresh into COVID kind of had to meet virtually during finals. I mean, like it was kind of the worst possible timing ever. Um, <laughs> but like the motivation of our team is 
like unparalleled. I mean, we literally just like see a challenge and we're like, okay, how are we going to jump over that challenge? Like, how are we going to get to the next step? Um, we're a bunch of doers. Like we just get, we get stuff done. And it's because we know that what we're doing is very important work. And um, I think that when you really believe in something that you're doing, it doesn't really matter what challenges are in front of you, right? And so, it didn't, despite all of the challenges that were facing us being, you know, we couldn't meet in person or we had to navigate Zoom, like most of us, I don't think had really used Zoom, if not, you know, maybe a couple of times, but we now become Zoom masters. And, you know, I mean, we kind of just rolled with the punches and um, then all, all of the time that we could possibly muster. And I mean, like, it was a lot more time, I think, than any of us really allocated for. Um, but we knew that there were deadlines and we knew that like, if we waited, then we could lose our chance. And we just, we just went for it. Um, yeah, I know personally for, for me, uh, the specific activism like Carrie and I took a part of in Kutcha as well, was it was actually very invigorating to be a part of it because um, I felt very trapped in my house at the time, you know, not able to communicate like, you know, we had been so used to and it felt like good. It felt good to do something that was making a positive effect and difference, you know. We talk, we talk about, you know, going out and doing marches. We talk about, you know, screaming chants, making signs. But, you know, a lot of that same work is staying at home on a computer researching bylaws. <laughs> and so it, it was very invigorating to do it. And I'd, I'd seen that done before me, you know, when there was an occupation of the Native Forum just to keep it the Native American Forum. You know, it wasn't asking for much, you know, just to see students go that distance for that really inspired me to do something in my own personal life. You know, it's like, I can make a change. We all can, we all have a voice. We all have a body, you know, that we can work towards that better vision, that dream we all want. I want to, I want to say that there was a group of students who occupied the native American forum, uh, in 2015. And from the time that this space was built, it was, designated as the Native American Forum. It was a space for Native community, for Native presentations. And the students occupied it in 2015 in part because they were watching as the designation of these spaces was becoming less and less solidified. And they were concerned that it wasn't being called the Native American Forum. And they wanted a rededication to Indigenous peoples, lifeways, knowledges at Humboldt State, because Humboldt State is so centralized. I mean, if you don't know, like Humboldt State is um, located in Wiat territory in Goudini, which is among the Redwoods, right? And we have nine federally recognized tribes, like in this region, like just in Humboldt County. And we have one of the largest populations. So while the state of California is less than like 2% Native American, in total, in Humboldt County, we are six to 7% of the population. And so you see students constantly coming in and seeing the powerful nature of our tribes and how important they are to this region. And they want that to be reflected on their campus and in their community at Humboldt State. And they keep making that happen. And so I think we need to really acknowledge that the work that was done by these students in 2015 to occupy the forum, to take on that effort, which at the time was like both not very well received, but also super supported, right? But like to take on as they're being students, um, I think it's really important to say that because of that work, students who feel empowered to step up in times like this. And so I wanna, cause I know some of those students, right? They're still in this area who did that movement. I wanna tell them it was because of you all that these students felt empowered now to be able to say, we also want to do something. We also wanna make sure this area acknowledges and is safe for indigenous peoples and students that it actually brings in community. So to know that your movements make a difference and to know that even if at the time you felt like, well, what, what we got wasn't what we thought we wanted or maybe it was, it was too much work or whatever, it made such a difference 
from 2015 to 2019 to 2020, it was because of those first students that now we have these students. And I think these students are going to inspire the next generation of students to what they want their campus to be and to make sure that they can bring that into fruition. And so I'm so proud to see that continuing at Humboldt State in a really, really meaningful way, but generation to generation of students. I would have to agree with that, um, Katja, like when I learned about the activism that students took on campus, um, you know, it kind of like lights a fire and you're like, well, you know, they work so hard to get what they want and it, you know, even though there was still this challenge in front of us, it like made it that much more clear that like we needed to continue to push and fight for this, um, this space and for this project to be able to happen. Um, and I hope that people don't in the future don't have to do all of this, but I hope that they do feel inspired, um, you know, by the stuff that we've been able to accomplish as a team. Thank you all. Um, we have a question in the Q and A. Um, Brittany would like to know if there are any text or video recommendations that you have for folks who want to learn more about food sovereignty. I'm actually going to give a quick answer before I turn it over to you. Um, there's a great book called um, an Ind Indigenous, oh, I'm forgetting the title, um, Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, edited by Devin Maheshua and Elizabeth Hoover. Um, we are going to have Devin Maheshua speak next Monday at 1 p.m. and she will be talking about that text, The State of Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, as well as her new book, Recovering Our Ancestors' Gardens. Um, I'll throw the presentation flyer and the registration link into the chat in just a moment. But what are your guys' uh, favorite food sovereignty uh, readings? Salmon and acorns feed our people is a great one. And it's a great local example too. Um, and it definitely gives the really great scientific approach to food sovereignty as well. And the importance of these foods to our peoples. That's a really great one. That's the first one that came to my mind as well. Um, and it's very current. It just came out like this within 2020 or 2019. It's hard to remember years at this point, but um, <laughs> Yeah, local and current. So I would definitely recommend checking that one out. I can uh, recommend the documentary Gather, which just came out and you can now rent it if you want to on Amazon. You can go to Amazon and rent it. You can buy it, I think too. But uh, the documentary Gather features people doing food sovereignty work all over the United States, but also has a local uh, feature on the work happening with salmon and uh, with the ancestral guard in Yurok territory. So that's one really great one. The second thing I'll say is the Tending Nature series, which uh, is through KCET, is an amazing, amazing uh, series. They're actually coming out with a new season very soon, but they have several episodes specifically about food sovereignty. And they have one about the work being done in this region uh, around at the UIHS food garden and the UIHS like healing spaces. And I would really recommend knowing about our local food sovereignty projects. So if you can, I would really look up the United Indian Health Service Potawat um, food garden. I'd also look up the Blue Lake Rancheria's food sovereignty garden, which they have made several um, video, short videos about on YouTube. And you can really find out about the work that they're doing locally because they're some of the leading projects like on this. They're the ones that are leading the way in what this looks like. But Tending Nature is a really, really good series for that and totally publicly available. And you can watch all kinds of things about food sovereignty that's happening. Thank you for all those excellent resources. Um, the All of you in the audience can find the title of the books and documentary series, um, as well as the link to the episode Dr. Risling Baldi just mentioned about UIHS, um, as well as the Blue Lake Rancheria Food Sovereignty Initiative. So you can find all of that information in your chat. Um, don't forget to copy and paste it before we end today. Um, 
Um, we have we don't have another question, but we have a nice comment and I want to read it for you. Um, thank you so much for your work on this. I love it. Um, I'm a member. Um, this is from Jamie Delson. I'm a member of a local community. I am working on a project that is working on assisting people in need to access local land to live in their villages to assist each other to live in a more environmentally sustainable way. Perhaps there is room for collaboration. Um, I've worked with students and professors in the past on this project and with so many HSU students who are in need anywhere from a place to live to food, taking this to the wider community makes sense. Cheers. Great. That's uh, we love to hear when people are excited about this work and can envision and see possible sites of collaboration. And so excellent. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you for all that are here today. It is 2.30, that went by pretty quick. Um, I wanna be uh, cognizant of our speakers' very busy schedules um, and we'll be ending this session. You can find the recording on the Facebook page. Um, this will also be posted on YouTube in a couple of days. And I would just want to remind people that you can donate to the HSU Food Sovereignty Lab. Um, any amount helps um, and it's a great way to kind of show and support the work that we are doing. All right, have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody, and we'll see you next Monday. Are you gonna go off Facebook, Caitlin? Yeah, okay, um, stop live stream, click, okay. Yay, okay, Can I, I should stop recording now too, huh? Yeah. Okay, stop recording. I'm so glad that worked.